going to speak about U.S. terror policy in flux. Naturally, I will discuss the Obama administration and its policies, but I will also look at the changes in U.S. terror policy over time. I, I, I'm going to say many harsh things about many well-intentioned people who have fought terror from the days of Richard Nixon to the current team led by President Barack Obama. Honestly, I do not believe that I have all the answers. I will try to offer some of the right questions. Uh, we must also say that no matter how smart we are, how well educated, how stout of heart, we're all going to make mistakes fighting terror. And that's for a very easy reason. Terrorism is different, fighting terrorism is different than fighting crime or fighting a conventional war. Fighting terror, unlike fighting a conventional war or fighting crime, requires a much higher order of intelligence, intelligence in every sense, strategic intelligence and regular intelligence. Everything from book smarts to street smarts. It also demands emotional intelligence. The ability to look at oneself and one's own efforts to find and admit one's own mistakes. As the 9-11 Commission said, fighting terror demands imagination, imaginative intelligence. That's another form of intelligence. It means looking around the corner. You know, when people do kata, martial arts form, they are imagining where an attack is coming. And they do these movements that anticipate the attack. You have to think outside the box. You have to get beyond the usual codes of bureaucracy and the usual precincts of the politically correct. Sadly, many things suggest that we are returning to those same old places where we were before 9-11. Indeed, instead of using our imagination, we are using pretense. We are often pretending that we have no problem, that we have everything under control. This is the kind of thinking that gets you killed. This is the kind of thinking that terrorists love. This is the kind of thinking that muggers love. People who are smug and complacent. That is because the worst lies are the lies we tell ourselves. And the most dangerous lies are the lies we tell ourselves about terrorism. Democratic leaders sometimes lie about terrorism. They lie about terror, they lie about tyrants. Sometimes they lie because they are guided by wishful thinking, which is the worst enemy of good analysis. A classic example, we all know it is Neville Chamberlain, thinking he had achieved peace in his time. Sometimes democratic leaders lie for political convenience and survival. A classic example is Stanley Baldwin, the prime minister before Neville Chamberlain, who covered up Nazi Germany's rearmament and its violation of treaties. They were both British prime ministers who preceded Winston Churchill. Churchill forgave Chamberlain. He never forgave Baldwin. You understand that? Churchill gave the eulogy at Neville Chamberlain's funeral. When he heard that Stanley Baldwin died, he said, burn him, bury him, take no chances. <laughs> Churchill never forgave Baldwin because Baldwin lied to his people, lied about a danger that was there, that could have been fought, that could have been defeated, and he did it for political expedience. We have seen similar patterns of lying to oneself and the public from Israeli prime ministers and American presidents. In the case of Richard Nixon, political convenience and survival were usually the motive, not wishful thinking. As for Jimmy Carter and some of his top aides, they believed Ayatollah Khomeini was a moderate. Really, I'm not kidding. Uh, Carter's UN ambassador, it was Andy Young, not Susan Rice, said, Khomeini, ain't he some kind of a saint? The State Department issued papers confirming that Khomeini was indeed a moderate. So Carter's era was something of a reprise of wishful thinking. 
In the case of Ronald Reagan, whose administration got involved in sending arms to Iran, we saw lying caused both by wishful thinking and political connivance. Reagan is a particularly confounding and confusing example. He was a man who faced down the Soviet regime, what he called the evil empire, but he was willing to make a deal with the Ayatollahs, and he backed down in Lebanon when faced with Syrian-inspired terror. He backed down. As for Bill Clinton, he and his top officials lied to themselves about terror for many reasons and in many ways. There was a joke about Clinton and his first CIA director, Jim Woolsey. Some of you may have heard it. Uh, in respect, it seems particularly eerie. The joke was that in order to get to see Clinton, Woolsey would have to crash his plane into the White House. Clinton saw him, I think, three times in two years. He saw his FBI director, Louis Free, four or five times in four or five years. And I could tell you stories about his other CIA directors. They would just blow you away. But for that, you'll have to read my book. Just a little bit more on Clinton. Budgets for CIA operations were cut back. Few agents with knowledge of foreign languages, especially Arabic, Persian, Urdu, were put in the field. Clinton rarely saw CIA or FBI directors. And he gave a very low priority to intelligence gathering. Profiling rules were put into place in dealing with airplanes. 9-11 Commission doesn't really talk about it. It's between the lines. You have to find it. What eventually hit on 9-11 was that plane Jim Woolsey was on trying to get a White House appointment. What eventually hit on 9-11 was a festering infection of ignoring a clearly rising trend of terror. Anybody who had read the State Department reports, Patterns of Global Terrorism, and it's a whitewashed report. It's a whitewashed report. You could see the trend lines very clearly. You knew that something was going on. Clinton didn't want to know. In the case of George W. Bush, I think we see a lot of wishful thinking, especially when it comes to the idea of democratizing the Arab world while not looking hard enough at some of the real terror supporting states in the world, such as Iran and North Korea. In the case of the administration of Barack Obama, and I'm going to talk a lot about him and his administration, the record of four and a half years, particularly the last year, bespeaks a scale of lying about terrorism and national security issues that surpasses even Richard Nixon. At the end of the PowerPoint, I'm going to go over some of the biggest lies. But instead of just hitting you with stuff, I figure I'll give you a little historical perspective first. So let me see if I can get the PowerPoint running. Uh, US terror policy has been a constantly changing organism since it was first announced by President Richard Nixon almost haphazardly at a press conference on September 5th, 1972, after the Munich massacre. And 40 years later, Barack Obama's big terror speech on May 23rd. Richard Nixon's terror was a period of rise, uh, tenure was a period of rising terror, many plane hijackings, when the Palestinian movement defined how it would use terror. America as the free world leader, a major industrial power, employer of aviation and shipping had to respond. Uh, in his speech on the 23rd, basically Obama said terror had subsided, there was no need for a Patriot Act, and he once again called for closing down uh, Guantanamo Bay. Richard Nixon enunciated a policy of not talking to terrorists. Barack Obama has ordered a policy of not talking about terrorists. Inside uh, the FBI, the CIA, the US Army, I've met many of the people there in Washington and in New York. 
They have been told never to use two words in the same sentence, Islamic and terror, Islamic and extremism. Um, the shooting at Fort Hood was called workplace violence. This is very important because the battle for terror is first of all a battle for the mind. They are trying to get into our heads, we have to be in their heads. Richard Nixon's policy remains the enunciated policy of the United States, not talking to terrorists, and it has influenced many Western countries. It even influenced Israel, especially under Golda Meir. Uh, one should recall that Arab terror at that time, in the 1970s, was targeting Jewish targets everywhere, immigrants to Israel, Soviet immigrants. It was a dramatic and a traumatic period. And while the Nixon administration was talking publicly about not talking to terrorists, they were pressing Israel to release terrorists. This dialogue about terror continued under Yitzhak Rabin. U.S. terror policy in the 1970s also influenced several British prime ministers very strongly, Edward Heath, Harold Wilson, James Callaghan, and French leaders such as uh, uh, Georges Pompidou, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. Um, and German chancellors, Helmut Kohl, Willy Brandt, The U.S. often got angry in public when France, Germany, Britain would let terrorists go. The U.S. quietly did the same sometimes. Um, talking tough about terror and acting soft on terror is something that happened very frequently, even with Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger. Nixon had a well-deserved reputation as a tough bargainer, as a tough policy maker. He was known as a man who was willing to face tough adversaries like Khrushchev, Nikita Sergeyevich, <laughs> taming a lion. But he and his advisors often caved in to demands. This includes Henry Kissinger. Nixon and Kissinger played ball with terrorists. Where did I get that picture? I had to call up the Yankee office and they, they got me that picture. <laughs> Richard Nixon throwing out the ball. Sometimes they would ask Israel to send people away quietly, make a concession so an American diplomat could be released. This happened all the time. Nixon and Kissinger talked the tough talk but often took us off. They hid, as I mentioned, Arafat's role in killing American diplomats. The actual orders were heard and recorded by American intelligence at the National Security Agency. Recorded over an open telephone line. This is uh, Cleo Noel, George Curtis Moore. I don't have the picture for uh, uh, Mr. Eid, uh, Guy Eid, who is the actually of, of Jewish descent, I think, or partly Jewish descent, um, the Belgian diplomat who was at a party at the U.S. Embassy, and they were rounded up, brutalized, and then killed. Uh, State Department covered up. Harold Saunders was one of the key officials covering this up. It continued for many years. They helped preserve the fiction that Yasser Arafat was a moderate. They preserved the fiction that he was somehow different from Black September. You remember all these <coughs> names, Black September? A few years ago, there was a reporter at the New York Times, maybe I shouldn't mention his name, who said, um, well, that's the this part of the Fatah, not that part of the Fatah. And I said, 
shall I show you the payment slips where Yasser Arafat signs on to all of them? Uh, all the various parts of the Fatah, the, the martyrs for Al-Aqsa and the other ones? And uh, he was just astounded. The New York Times never wanted to run the story, which is part of the problem. There is a certain, not a certain, there is a great complicity in a kind of conspiracy of silence involving some of the major news media who don't want to print certain bits of information. Arafat was a full partner in the terror attacks run and operated by Khalil al-Wazir, known by his nickname Abu Jihad. Uh, over the years, entrenched American policy was to cover up for Arafat. This became second nature in the State Department. Arafat's ties to Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi. He was the favorite visitor of Ayatollah Khomeini, both at his home in Paris, at neuilly sur seine and later the first guest of the Iranian regime. The Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade got a lot of money from Iran, not just Hamas. Arafat was later the, the greatest guest of Bill Clinton at the White House, the, the most frequent guest on the White House visitors list. They believed Arafat was giving information, saving lives. Never happened. The best example of this is what happened in Beirut. There were tremendous attacks on U.S. forces and diplomats in Beirut in April and October 1983. 241 Marines were killed, 58 French paratroopers, 63 people at the U.S. Embassy in separate attacks. There was another attack later on at the Embassy. Ronald Reagan is seen here visiting the coffins. In his heart, Arafat was laughing everybody, every time anybody said he was a moderate. I'm focusing a little bit on Arafat because the Palestinian movement basically was the pioneer in developing, developing the techniques and some of the ideologies which later were used by Islamic terrorists like Osama bin Laden. And the American approach and the Western approach of forgiving or glossing over first appeared there also. That first picture there is the first World Trade Center hole. What people don't know today is that what happened in March 1993 was an attack that could have been far worse than 9-11. If the bomb had been moved two feet in one direction, it would have knocked out the support pillar and both buildings would have collapsed one into the other almost simultaneously. 50,000 people would have died within six minutes. So when you think of 3,000 people dying, imagine what happened. The top people at the CIA, the FBI, the White House said, ah, only six people died. It's no big deal. There's a big hole in the ground. The top CIA counterterrorism expert, a fellow by the name of Paul Pilar, Paul Pilar referred to these guys as the ad hoc terrorists. These were the people who eventually became uh, Al-Qaeda, the same people. They came out of the, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman. They were active, by the way, in the United States before 1993 and 9-11 in 2001. Nobody wanted to look. One of their people killed Mayor Kahana in New York in 1990. Boxes of materials with plans, blueprints of what they were going to do was found, were found. FBI didn't bother looking at it, just put it away someplace. They didn't have enough people to read Arabic, and besides, they didn't want to read. So, just put it away someplace else. Of course, 9-11. Uh, Obama deserves credit for killing Osama bin Laden. But the, diff the reality is a little different from the press clippings. Osama bin Laden was already wanted dead or alive for a long time, actually from the period of Bill Clinton. It's just getting enough material to find him and get lucky enough to find him. 
it's good that they found him. It's too bad it took so long. Uh, in the meantime, President Obama and Eric Holder pushed a policy of deliberately stopping sources of intelligence. Enhanced interrogation. By the way, Senator Obama, very much a, a critic of the terror surveillance program, the banking monitoring program. These were very effective programs that weren't blunderbuss programs. They were getting information on conversations from out of the country coming into the United States, bank transfers that were suspicious. They weren't getting 200 AP reporters or uh, everybody on a list from Verizon and saying, let's go and see where it falls. This was a very well-targeted program. It was closed down. So was enhanced interrogation. If you want to know where somebody's going, you have to get inside their organization. That's why the Israeli Shin Bet is so effective. It uses lots of different techniques. Human intelligence is important. You cannot just rely on drones. Um, to be fair to Obama, and I want to be fair to Obama, he is not the only American president whose reputation exceeds reality. Uh, Ronald Reagan is known as a real tough guy. Ronald Reagan caved into Hafez Assad after uh, an American jet was shot down over Lebanon, and then Jesse Jackson went to get the pilot. You remember that? Some of you may remember that. It's actually pretty shameful, but okay. Reagan also made deals with the Ayatollahs. Today we have a problem. Uh, in his speech on May 23rd, President Obama said, we're well defended. We've basically knocked Al-Qaeda out. Um, but what happened in Boston? What happened in Benghazi? The beheading in London? Many other events that you're not even hearing about. Attacks on recruiting stations from Spokane, Washington to Little Rock, Arkansas. Sniping attacks. Show that there is a whole new generation that has come up and been inspired. Inspire is the proper word because that is Al Qaeda's web magazine. Killing Osama bin Laden was excellent. Cutting off the head of the snake was very good. Absolutely. The problem is that the snake gave birth to a lot of little vipers in the 20 years before he was killed. And we have to still find those vipers and those who were inspired by them. There's a lot going on out there, and I hope that we find them and get them, maybe even deter some of them, although I'm not a big fan of deterring terrorists. I don't think it works that well. We have to work hard, very hard. I'm sorry to have to show you this picture, but it's important. This is a picture of Chris Stevens, who by all accounts was a tremendous diplomat, a man who studied the languages, worked hard, was brave, wanted to help his country, wanted to help mankind, really wanted to help Libyans. I agree with Hillary Clinton with her sentiments. We were working so hard for Libya, how could they do this? It's a, it's a Hillary comment. Um, She's right, and that's often true when you're a democratic country, you have the best of intentions and you don't always get rewarded for your good intentions. The other picture is Ambassador Stevens right before he died. Well, people say he was just suffocating. If you look at him, you can see that he went through a lot more. And there are all kinds of things on Arab websites talking about the fact that he was homosexually raped. This actually occurred to Gaddafi also before he was executed. It is a way of shaming somebody and showing... Um, it's a power trip. Uh, Michael Jonathan Porath, I thank you for your really riveting presentation. We're still haunted by the picture of Ambassador Stevens right behind you, which is a lesson. How about in terms of future trends? Future trends. We are in profits, um, but I saw recently in the paper that, uh, according to some surveys, uh, America is becoming, I don't know if it was isolationist, but much more withdrawn. 
the administration does not seem to be going any place, so there doesn't seem to be much political change. Um, uh, Mrs. Clinton is up next, though there could be something else, of course. I mean, will the, do you see the trends in the American approach continuing, or will something happen to make this more aggressive, more active, more effective in the future? There are disturbing trends inside both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Um, there's a problem in democratic societies. When you face a problem, it's sometimes easier to attack your friends than to attack your enemies. You can press your friends for concessions. It's harder to press your enemies. We've seen a lot of that. Those of us in Israel have felt that pressure. Not from just this administration, but from other administrations. Henry Kissinger in his memoirs talks about this. He says that if the Israelis discover acts of terror, they're going to demand a response. If they discover Egypt has violated a treaty, they're going to ask for a response. And we're going to pretend, he said to Nixon, that nothing happened because that's what suits us politically. Now, if you look at the Democratic and Republican parties today, the Democratic Party is building itself to a certain extent on new immigrants. It has always, but today even more many of these from South America, but they're also paying a lot more attention to Muslim immigrants, especially in key voting areas, Chicago, Michigan. The Republican Party includes people who have a libertarian streak. I know them. I have a libertarian streak myself. I keep it under control. Uh, if you look at somebody like Ron Paul, Rand Paul, they're so far right, they're almost left. You see their approach to foreign policy, the isolationists meet. The isolationists from the left meet with the isolationists from the right. Uh, if you heard any of the campaign speeches of Ron Paul, he talks about the fact that the U.S. was attacked because it offended Muslims. What we did to them, that, that was his basic approach. There's a lot of that in the Democratic Party. There's a Secretary of State today who, when he was a senator, was in the basement of the Senate in Washington hearing from an Israeli visiting official two days after 9-11. And he said, what would, did we do to make them hate us so? And the Israeli official, who shall remain nameless, but who has a very stentorian vote and a wife who's not liked publicly very much, <laughs> said, if that's what you think, then you really didn't hear what I was saying. You weren't listening. If you can ask that kind of a question, well, that's the same question that Hillary asked. How could they do that to us after what we did for Libya? It's a conscious desire not to see what's in front of your face. Uh, Europe did that for a long time. Europe is only slightly beginning to come out of it now. People like Tony Blair, uh, David Cameron, Angela Merkel, Fran uh, Sarkozy, I've talked about the failure of the multicultural dream, the failure of assimilating <coughs> large Islamic populations. It's not because they're anti-Muslim. They're not anti-Muslim. They're not anti-immigrant. They're looking at a reality on the ground, and they're beginning to, say, beginning to say, we have a problem. The United States, some of its parties, for short-term short convenience are increasing the problem. Get more immigrants, no matter where they come from, there are more voters, they'll vote for us, it'll be all right. The next guy will deal with it. That's bad thinking. But unfortunately, that's what I see the trend as. Unless and until there's a shock. When a building falls on your head, you pay attention. At least for a couple of years. And then you forget again. That's, uh, that's a problem. Uh, I think uh, terrorist leaders... First, uh, say your name for the record. The Killing terrorist leaders can be useful. But I think that uh, there is a more de dangerous trend, which is the flow of money that comes from the United States through some kind of small banks or society that be social, religious societies. And there is a flow of money to terrorist organizations. 
What has been done by the United States government to stop this flow of money? It's a wonderful question. It's a wonderful question. And it's, uh, you must be a student of the Talmud. Because the Talmud has a very interesting saying, which was quoted to me once by uh, one of the smartest people in Israeli police many years ago, um, Kaplan, who was then the head of Mechkal uh, Pituach. He said to me from the, from the um, Talmud, Let Achbar Ganav Chula Ganav. The mouse is not the robber, the mouse hole is the robber. In other words, if you let somebody get away with his ill-gotten goods, that's the problem. Egress, you can cut the terror chain in many ways. Explosives, arms, training, money. Do you know that Eric Holder stopped the indictments a few months ago of the Holy Land Trust? There was a second wave of indictments. Nobody's reported this. this these are indictments that deal with people like CARE, organizations like CARE, second tier and third tier organizations, and who deal with Hamas. And they've got a lot of money. Some of these people are now involved here in Gaza, came to the U.S. Uh, Abu Malzouk, some of them. They were in Florida, southern Florida. Sure, they were Boy Scouts. They weren't doing anything wrong, right? Uh, The money trail is very important. The Obama administration is working in exactly the opposite direction. Uh, the Bush administration had a terror banking law. The New York Times outed this terror law. They revealed it. They broke security. The Bush administration was too kind to the New York Times. The Bush administration, I know this very well because my publisher, Simon & Schuster, published the work of James Risen, who wrote the story about the terror surveillance program. And the New York Times pretended it couldn't stop the book being published, even though all the research was done by its reporter. Never mind. The, the New York Times could have been treated much more roughly by the Bush administration. Instead of tapping their phones, which is what Obama did to James Rosen of Fox, taking the phone records, which is what they did to the AP, Bush and um, Cheney and all those other evil men invited them down to the Oval Office and asked them, please don't do this. They invited Democratic leaders from the Senate and the House to come with them and say, please don't do this. And then the New York Times did it and got a Pulitzer Prize. Twice. The AP made a big deal about the New York Police Department following people in mosques and everything else. You know what? Thank God for the New York Police Department. The New York Police Department stopped 13 or 14 terror attacks within the last two years. Some of them you haven't heard of, but some of them could have been very, very dangerous. And they did it by doing something that the federal government has stopped doing, using their head using imagination, trying to stay a step ahead. And this is actually a very serious and interesting trend. Local law enforcement is doing more against terror. I saw this also in Illinois and St. Louis, uh, Missouri, when I was there. They asked me to talk to the Joint Task Force. They asked me questions that showed that they were serious. Uh, this gentleman mentioned the money trend. Oh, my, my name's Aaron Hecht. Um, this gentleman mentioned the money train, and uh, in, in the last two years, there's been a lot of reports about how Hezbollah in, uh, in Lebanon has, they've lost a lot of the money they used to be getting from Iran, and so they've resorted to uh, drug dealing and other crimes. Is it possible that uh, law enforcement could become interested in fighting terrorism because they're involved in crime, uh, and even if they're not you know, interested in fighting them because they're involved in terrorism anymore? We've never met, have we? I ask you this because in 1992, I wrote a story about Syria using drug running to get money for New Republic. It was part of what I was doing for the Israeli government. And my, my buddy Yossi Ben Aharon said, you be the hitman and focus on what the Syrians are doing and put a little pressure on them. And I went after drugs. At that time, 20% of the heroin in the United States came from Syria and Lebanon. 
and they were also refining a lot of cocaine from South America through the Bacá Valley and back into other places in Europe. Obviously, terror organizations have been using drugs for years. I don't know that Hezbollah's lost its Iranian money. There, there's a little bit of a fight going on there because Iran wants more control and Sheikh Nasser Allah sometimes has his own ideas. But fine, if you want to go after the, the terrorists because they're also criminals, not just terrorists, that's fine. I have a different approach. I th but you give me, what's your first name again? Aaron, Aaron you give me a, an interesting in to another part of it which I didn't speak about. Do you know that people are being converted in American and British and French jails to Islam because you get special treatment in prison if you're a Muslim, religious Muslim. You have gangs that protect you. But that's also a terrific source of talented manpower for the terrorist organization. You want to have counterfeiters, people who can break locks, jump over fences, know how to install a six-inch blade between the fifth and the sixth rib very quickly. These are skills that are important to have when you're a terrorist. And that's where you're getting a lot of people. And by the way, a lot of the uh, aborted terror attacks in the United States are people who come from that background. Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, was basically uh, drafted in a British jail. So yes, follow that. But the basic approach to fighting terror has to be totally different than fighting crime. Because it's a special crime. It's like treason. It's so great. Treason is actually mentioned in the U.S. Constitution. Terrorism doesn't have to be mentioned because it's not just about defeating the state. It's about defeating society, bringing society down. So the crime is so great, you have to prevent it from happening. You don't go and prosecute it. If necessary, you kill the guy before he commits the crime. You certainly, or you try to dissuade him before he or she or they commit the crime. By the way, Israel has some experience with this, with Jewish terrorism. There were some wise guys, including somebody who became the Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court, who figured the way to stop Jewish terrorism was to catch them in the act. So smart. So smart. This is a plan that was born in Helm. Hmm. The, the, it, it, it. So they let people run around with bombs and put them on five buses so that they could catch them. And then they lost one of the buses. I, I mean, really? That's what you have to do to stop a terror attack? Don't worry about the conviction. Stop the terror. Stop the terror. There have been a couple of cases here in Israel where they did that. They went over to somebody and they said, we're following you, we're watching you, we know what you're planning. If you do it, we'll kill you and your children. The guy stopped. Is it polite? Is it the Marquise of Queensberry rules? No, but you're not fighting the Marquise of Queensberry. You're fighting somebody else. And you have to defeat them. And you have to show them that what they're doing will not succeed then you can go back to the regular rules. You have to fight. Time for one more question in the back. Um, the, uh, my name's Andrew Balcom, as excellent talk. I wanted to ask you why you stopped at Benghazi when it, that was supposed to be the starting point you were finishing in Boston. I just mistimed it a little bit. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, it's like that Clint Eastwood movie, Trouble with the Curve. I. I overswung and I hit it to left instead of hitting it down the middle. I had a list of lies that are been going on and um, I was going to include them. Um, I'll just quickly, uh, the Libya attack lie is one. Um, the engaging tyrants and terrorists lie. You know, you can, you can charm them, they'll change. That's a big lie. Uh, the national security information lie. Uh, the Obama administration is correct. You have to gather information. And you sometimes have to use high tech. One of the reasons they've gone crazy with overreacting and overdoing some of the things they're doing now is they shut down what Bush, 
Cheney and Rumsfeld had put in place before, which was much more careful, much more select, and much more effective than what they're doing now. So you run into Verizon and you take everything and you th through, put it through some scanning program. That's not as smart as a, a very focused program. Um, we don't even know everything about Boston. We've discovered that these Charnayev brothers murdered three people before the Boston Marathon Massacre. Apparently three Jewish people. There may be other things that are going on. The Boston police have not exactly covered themselves with honor in the last couple of years in the way they've handled their investigations. There are things here that need to be ferreted out. I don't know if they will. Strange things happen in Massachusetts.